And good evening, good morning, wherever you are in the world. Thank you very much for joining us. My name is Dr. Anthony Chow, the uh, director of the School of Information at San Jose State. Uh, I want to thank you for joining us and special thanks to our honored guest and Lloyda Garcia Febo and our who is our uh, health and wellness and sustainability ambassador uh, for coordinating today's wonderful celebration. As director and also through my work with the five tribes that we're working with right now, I've had the privilege of really seeing the beauty of our world and the and the beauty really is truly breathtaking. From the mighty redwoods of the Yurok tribe in California, to the expansive rose-colored buttes of the Northern Cheyenne in Montana, the bountiful creeks and swamps of the Lumbee in North Carolina, the red canyons of the Santa Domingo Pueblo in New Mexico, and of course, the stoic blue mountains of the Eastern band of Cherokee Indians in the Smoky Mountains. Thank you uh, to our earth for providing us with so much. And we're all learning to become better stewards of you so that our future, future generations could live and see you and all of his blunder hundreds and thousands of years from now. Thank you to our amazing librarians, uh, Laura, uh, and our, our, our guests that will be joining us shortly, uh, who have joined us in your work in sustainability and protecting our environment. A full transcription of today's symposium will be posted on our website within the next couple of weeks. Um, and now it uh, is a great honor to introduce you to Loida Garcia Febo, and who will introduce herself and our distinguished panel. Loida. Thank you, Dr. Chow. It's wonderful to be here today celebrating Earth Day. And um, I'm so excited about this program today. We have um, really cool librarians that are going to present some of their work, and then we're going to have a conversation about what they do and more uh, to find out how they are also helping to preserve our planet. And um, I was just commenting earlier that I met Laura, one of our uh, esteemed speakers, when I went to her library system, Pikes Peak Public Library in um, District Library in Colorado, as part of my library advocacy tour when I was ALA president. And that was the first stop and they were wonderful. Um, I remember that we experienced almost all the seasons in two days. It was just incredible. And that is Colorado, uh, really for you. And that's what I learned when I was there. Uh, everybody was wonderful. And then I learned that um, some years later, I learned that Laura has um, had applied and then she was accepted and was going to Antarctica. And so that is wonderful. And we're going to find out more about that. I met our other speaker that should be with us soon. Erin Hollingsworth some years ago uh, in diverse library work and committee work from ALA. And I didn't realize that she lived in Alaska. So when I was ALA president again, I went there and I met her in her natural environment. And uh, I realized that Erin lives in the what we call the North Pole, the Arctic. Uh, and it's called Baro, actually, um, and he has another uh, indigenous name. And we're going to learn more about that, too, today. And um, she has to take a bush plane to go and serve uh, um, school libraries. And uh, that is her regular life. It's very interesting. And so I hope that you are excited, like me, to learn more about the various um, jobs and services they have but uh, today, I would like to start with um, a talk about the day, about Earth Day. And so I will start with that, and then we will go into a conversation with our uh, colleagues. Um, we're going to have a presentation. It's going to be great. And now I will share my screen. All right, here we are. Okay, and as you can see, we have beautiful pictures here of our speakers as well. 
Our um, event today has titled From Antarctica to Alaska, Librarians Joining the Global Movement to Preserve Our World. And again, happy Earth Day. And thank you so much for joining us to celebrate Mother Earth. Um, a recording of this event will be available and I'm sure um, librarians and library school students from all over the world will tune in because we're going to share it everywhere. Welcome then, students, professors, alumni, library workers, everyone. I'm very happy to open the celebration of Earth Day today. We are also, once again, featuring presentations and conversations with librarians working in the Arctic and that had worked in the Antarctic. I am delighted to collaborate with San Jose State University iSchool to increase awareness about sustainability, development, and preserving our planet through blog posts, videos, and events like this one. Stay tuned to the iSchool communication channels to find out how to participate, how to join the events, how to read blogs and watch the videos and how to learn how libraries can contribute to preserving the planet. Established in 1970, Earth Day has grown into a global celebration, mobilizing one billion people every year. This year's theme is Planet versus Plastic. Global organizations are calling on everyone to advocate for widespread awareness on the health risk of plastics. Rapidly phase out all single-use plastics, urgently push for a strong United Nations Treaty on Plastic Pollution, and demand an end to fast fashion. They are calling us to join a movement to build a plastic-free planet for generations to come. Let's watch a short video about this. So it's very impactful, right, when you see the situation. Okay. All right, so now I'm going back to the presentation. Well, as you can see, we are all very excited about this celebration. And across the nation also, uh, there are many uh, libraries and librarians that are celebrating Earth Day. We have made this an Earth Month, Earth Week, and all very happy to uh, advocate actually for the preservation of our planet. And um, here on screen, we have the United Nations 17 Sustainable Development Goals. These are intrinsically linked to Earth Day celebrations, and they are a call to action to end poverty, protect the planet, and improve the lives and prospects of everyone, everywhere. The 17 goals were adopted by the United Nations members, including the United States, back in 2015. And we are halfway to what they call the 2030 Agenda. That's the goal to um, improve and um, impulse um, development until 2030. Essentially, the Sustainable Development Goals, or the SDGs as they are known, include areas related to social, economic, and environmental aspects, and uh, also areas related to peace, 
into the partnerships needed to have a more sustainable world. And therefore, we are in sync. These celebrations are in sync with global efforts and global bodies supporting the preservation of our planet. We are loving Mother Earth and San Jose State University's Environmental Resource Center also celebrated um, the last, last week, Earth Day, with a sort of festival. So we are all linked. I wanted to share that the School of Information is taking action to promote sustainability. Last year, we celebrated Earth Day with a very interesting event with librarians that had served at academics and public libraries that went through a very interesting transformation due to climate change. And we heard about that. And also librarians that have served in the Galapagos Islands in the Grand Canyon. Their recording is available on the school's YouTube channel. You can see it on the screen. So we hope that you can come back and visit and watch that recording. We also have a matrix that I created on the website of the school indicating specific contributions to sustainability in the areas of teaching, research, organizational practices, and partnerships. And these are ongoing, so probably there are more, um, more recent ones that we maybe have to review this matrix. I just created, as a surprise for this event, a first draft to reflect how the classes taught at the school um, are sort of in sync and matching with the sustainable development goals. Um, everything we do in libraries is directly related to sustainability and development. And if we look at the chart, um, you might not be familiar, but this is a chart that the ALA, United Nations Task Force, created and is free, downloadable from the website. I will present that in a minute. And so what I use is that I use the template that it's on the ALA website, and I just wrote some of the um, names of the classes according to um, the goals, the sustainable development goals that they may match with. And this is a draft, but I wanted to show it because it really reflects that everything we do in library schools or in libraries is related to, or can be related to preserving and saving our planet. For instance, we are helping uh, people maybe uh, when in the reference services, goal one, it's about uh, no poverty. And there are classes to um, about how to teach right uh, future librarians on how to do reference information services and that can potentially help people to find information that may help them to reduce um, their their uh, poverty level so everything maybe sounds aspirational but it can be very practical it can really save lives as well um, for instance we have here goal six clean water and sanitation and then we have the class of online searching that can definitely be uh, uh, to support researchers and scientists that are always looking into how we can have clean water. And um, the other piece, for instance, this is, I divided the, the chart in two so we could see it clearly. Um, we have here, for instance, uh, online learning tools and strategies for success. I put that with goal 14 because it can also help us and you know, to understand life below water, which is goal 14, but also scientists and researchers. And that's how we can also are supporting innovation in our world. And so there are different uh, classes and maybe um, we are, or can come back to the presentation. And at some point we can have this uh, displayed somewhere on the um, library website, but it's very interesting. The colors you see on the chart are the colors that the United Nations assign to each one of the goals. They don't have a significant, you know, yellow doesn't mean there is clean energy, but they assign those colors since they created the uh, sustainable development goals. And so I use them exactly in the, in the same uh, tones that they are using them. Um, let me see another one I wanted to show, for instance, big data technologies. 
they can definitely support industry innovation and infrastructure in our world. So they are, it's very fascinating. So I only used um, a number of the classes that I've found, but uh, maybe there is an exercise when you can assign a goal to each one of the classes provided or, or teach, teach by the uh, different faculties. I hope that you find this interesting. Libraries are definitely emphasizing information about Mother Earth this entire month. And we have to be up there with the times, right? And that's why I'm using this screen. And I'm not going to add anything else, but you might have been aware of what is the phenomenon that is happening in the world. And there was a library included in this phenomenon as well. But we are all part of the same planet. And so we need to um, think about the role of libraries, but also the different trends that are happening um, ongoing in our world. And we are part of that. But I wanted to call attention to specific examples of libraries now. For instance, the Morris Library at the University of Delaware has dedicated uh, messaging on their website and exhibits calling attention to books, video games, films, and documentaries about the environment, and all these to celebrate Earth Day. Los Angeles Public Library uh, has created a challenge. It's called Celebrate Earth Challenge, where patrons could complete five activities to have the opportunity to win a prize from the library store. Well, that's a nice incentive. School libraries across the country and even in Puerto Rico and Hawaii are also celebrating Earth Day at libraries and with events outside of libraries and also on their social media pages, including Instagram. And I included one here from uh, LitFit. Maybe you can find that out. That's a high school library. Because we have to be everywhere. So I wanted to include examples of different formats. Today is a great day to encourage each other. And I hope the various examples I have presented so far from academic, public school libraries, and from the library um an information sciences program, in this case from San Jose State University, are inspiring us to better serve our communities, our communities, students at academic libraries, the community at large public library, and more students at school libraries. Because we do need a more sustainable way of living and taking action because our environments are endangered by climate change and other threats, including social inequalities. And everyone should strive to protect the environment through sustainable development. This includes all types of libraries. Libraries are definitely essential to sustainability. We are, libraries are, development accelerators. What we do, librarians, um, when we are, uh, let me take a step back, what we mean when we talk about sustainability, the different actions we take are very important to encourage and motivate our patrons and the communities we serve. For instance, the ALA and its Sustainability Roundtable have stated that to thrive and evolve into the future, ALA and different organizations must adopt the triple bottom line mindset of sustainability. An organization practices must be not only economically feasible, but also socially equitable and environmentally sound. It is important to note that um, this is the um, ALA Sustainability Roundtable, and they, they're present in social media, in this case, Instagram. So it's important to note that they have presence in different media because libraries are full of energy, they are active, they are transformative, 
and they are sharing this message through different channels. And I want to um, show the uh, flexibility of libraries. They are where the patrons are. And that's why I'm showing these different examples. And to leave the environmental sustainability and library section of the International Federation of Library Associations and Institutions has also stated they believe that green and sustainable libraries take into account environmental, economic, and social sustainability. Those are very important for the work we do and the impact that we hope to have. The triple bottom line theory expands conventional business success metrics to include an organization's contributions to social well-being, environmental health, and a just economy. These bottom line categories are often referred to as the three Ps, people, planet, and prosperity. The triple bottom line is one of the core values of the ALA Sustainability Roundtable, and the others are equity, diversity, and inclusion work, resiliency, and transform transforming communities. Um, libraries as second responder an essential partner to their community's needs and aspirations. How then specifically libraries are contributing to sustainable development? In this case, uh, it's all part of preserving our earth. As part of the American Library Association's United Nations Sustainable Development Goals Task Force I chair, we created charts that demonstrate how academic, public, and school libraries are contributing. And here we have the web page from that task force. Important again to remember that the sustainable development goals are a call to end poverty and also protect the planet and improve the lives and prospects of everyone everywhere. So it's all linked. Now, I wanted to go over some of the goals. For instance, I selected academic libraries because perhaps there are more academic uh, librarians here or students at this time. And um, libraries are contributing in different ways. Let's see um, goal three. That is related to good health and well-being. For instance, how are we doing that? Scheduling events about, for instance, wellness, yoga, stress reduction to re during final exams, group exercise sessions, and therapy dogs. Those are some examples. Goal eight, it's about decent work and economic growth. Libraries are supporting faculty and student research through library collections, providing consultation and subject matter experts who can also help entrepreneurs. And um, let's go to goal 13, climate action. Libraries support university sustainability initiatives, carry out exchanges of used clothes and do it yourself events to teach people to create things and present series of talks about sustainability. So these are some examples, but we know that academic libraries in this case do much more. This is uh, the chart I use to kind of match the uh, high school classes with the Sustainable Development Goals. It was created again by the ALA Task Force on the UN Sustainable Development Goals. Oh, back. And um, these are templates featuring all the SDGs to which the libraries can add the library's name, logo, address, and a custom message to share with stakeholders and library patrons and show how they are contributing to sustainability and to preserving the planet. In addition to that, we also have a poster. And again, libraries can add their logo, telephone number, address, anything else they would like to do, add. And in addition to that, we also have bookmarks free downloadable from the website. And these are to support SDGs book clubs 
that libraries around the world are hosting. And here is an example, it's right on the webpage of the Sustainable Development Goals at the United Nations website. This library is um, in um, Serbia, I believe, and the librarian that created that was part of the ALA task force. Um, and so we're very happy that we were able to kind of, you know, work together in all that after she created it. So that's wonderful. What is the path forward? This is a short talk, and I wanted to close with the path forward. Librarians are researching. So that's very, very important. It actually um, can fuel innovation and can support research, scientists, and all these different transformation uh, that is, we see in the world with uh, even AI and, and so many other um, aspects of technologies. And to illustrate this point, I wanted to show research by Natalie Cardoso. And I showed this last year. There is no much um, really um, uh, different research in libraries and SDGs. So this is always new. It's a sort of checklist and it's, um, it's coming from her research, from Natalie Cardoso's research, titled Social Responsibility of Library Science in Transforming Society to Achieve Sustainable Development in the World. As a result, she developed various resources, and I wanted to highlight this checklist for libraries. The goal is, through the checklist, to provide insights into the topic of the SDGs and to encourage more librarians to think about actions and implement them in libraries. I recommend all types of libraries to use this checklist. For instance, let's look at the, the first goal, the one about no poverty. What are the actions? Well, let's see. Do we have specific collections about the topic? Do Can we do exhibits about this topic? Or can we then bring workshops, lectures, talks about human basic rights? or are we um, providing information literacy in the library? And here we have examples. It could be through workshop lectures, but it's also the regular work in services provided by libraries. We just have to connect the dots. Oh, do we have a book club? Well, we are in a way also supporting this no poverty, right? People need to read, then to go to school and so on. So it's just everything is interlinked. Another example comes from the Management of Library Association section of IFLA that I share. Um, again, there is no other um, webinar like this happening uh, in the last year. So I wanted to show it again for um, our colleagues that are tuning in to today's event. It is a series of webinars featuring different regions of the world. And they are all about how libraries are integrating and embracing sustainable developments um, to provide collections, services, and also how that is part of the work that library associations do. So it's very interesting. The other piece that we need to uh, move forward is to be part of the change. And last year, the United Nations announced 12 high impact initiatives as a package intended to accelerate progress of sustainability in the world. Today, I will highlight some of these initiatives for libraries and libraries course to consider when they are joining these movements. Libraries have great opportunities, for instance, in transforming trans education, helping to build a better future for all. Libraries are contributing, for instance, to um, help kids and anyone who needs to learn to read. Um, and also job seekers, they are learning different skills that may help them to secure jobs. Another aspect is accelerator. Libraries are accelerators on jobs and social protections. 
Libraries are supporting research and knowledge sharing. Additionally, libraries are part of wider social protection systems, not only as a basic public service, but also as a complement to employment and welfare policies. The other one is about digital public infrastructure. For instance, scaling inclusive and open digital ecosystems for sustainability. Libraries are key to partnerships for last mile innovation, as well as supporting the development of digital common and last mile innovation. Last mile means um, information literacy. That's how the UNESCO classifies that. Another aspect, supporting elimination of violence against women and girls. Libraries are often part of the wider public service infrastructure that supports women. That's very important. Nature driving economy transformation, leveraging the power of the biodiversity and nature to drive equitable economic progress and libraries are part of that. I still remember how librarians in Alaska were part of an initiative where they will drive around with a device in their cars trying to identify where were bats, bats that were in, in danger of extinction and that contribute to help and to uh, preserve the biodiversity of that region. Food systems transformation. That means uh, it's in the line of transforming food systems for sustainable world without hunger. And we often hear this term about food insecurity and how libraries are contributing to um, decrease that type of situation in, in the academic um, sector, in public libraries, and even in school libraries. So there are many ways in which we can contribute, not only with talks, but also with actual food drives or food pantries or collaborations, partnership with communities. There are many opportunities for us at libraries and library schools and, and academic public and school libraries to contribute to preserve our planet and to contribute to sustainability. And there are opportunities for LIS students and LIS programs as well. And I wanted to mention three of those. For instance, expanding human capital. First, by training students to understand how sustainability is going to make their world and their work better and more sustainable. We are here in, actually, the San Jose State University High School also has a class on that, on sustainability. It's all interconnected. And these areas shouldn't only be part of international development programs, but of most disciplines, including library and information sciences. Universities will need to educate the students on the social, economic, and environmental implications of their future careers and professional work. So it's all linked. linked. Research is also very important. As the universal agenda, researchers should help address the SDGs or sustainability at the global level, but also at the local level in the communities where you are, taking into account that the 2030 agenda focused on leaving no one behind and lifting out of poverty those in most need. Collaboration among universities may tackle the unequal distribution of universities and research centers, for example. There are many other areas that you can look into. Implementing principles of sustainability. It is important that university development projects are not isolated and are integrated in larger efforts that include government, civil society, and the private sector. And there is a really beautiful example. The, um, the iSchool has excellent projects and development in partnership with community organizations and other actors from society. And I included one in the matrix 
that I showed earlier, and that is the early children's literacy in Native American communities. And that is, has the name of Reading Nation Waterfall. And I invite you to look more about that. There is um, in the presentation and also on the websites of the school. Now to close, I hope you have time to unpack all the information received today together with your colleagues and classmates. Inform yourselves about sustainability, about their potential, and how we can contribute to preserve our planet. Read about what other libraries and organizations are doing. Review these examples I share and discuss with them your administration, with your colleagues, take action. Libraries are essential for sustainability and they are also key to social cohesion. Everything is interlinked. And by building sustainable bridges through teaching and learning with communities served by libraries, we can unlock potential for people to thrive today and tomorrow. Libraries and library workers are investing in our planet. This is what we're doing today. And we are contributing to help uh, societies to build back better and smarter. So I hope that this was of interest to you. And now I will stop sharing. And hopefully we have our speakers. I don't see one of our speakers and I hope she is. Okay, I'm going to check very quickly my messages here, just in case I have something. I don't see that here. Um, okay. Well, I don't. I don't see other um, messages from Erin. So we might have to have a conversation here. A very interesting conversation with Laura, <laughs> but. Um, I would like now to share information about our speakers. And so that's what I will do now. I will mention um, some bio information from the speakers and the speakers then will present about their work. And after that, we will have a conversation. All right, I will start with Laura. Laura London has worked in libraries for over 25 years and in many capacities. She began as a volunteer when, when you know, um, at the beginning of the career and received a position as elementary school librarian. She also worked as a middle school librarian as at the university and also as a university uh, librarian uh, in academia. She joined the Peace Corps twice and uh, she went to different areas, including the Iwakrama International Center for Rainforest Conservation and Development in Guyana. She has been with the Pikes Peak Library District for the past 11 years as a branch supervisor and just completed six months, six months sabbatical in Antarctica. And she's going to tell us all about that. And um, we'll... I can't, she, she said that she is eagerly awaiting her next chapter, and me too. It sounds really interesting. Um, we also hopefully have Erin Hollingsworth. She is the district librarian in the North Slope Borough School District. And let's see. Her position requires her to visit all eight remote communities on Alaska's North Slope. North Slope. Prior to that, she worked as the public services librarian at Tulsi Consortium Library in a college in Alaska. And it has very interesting um, names that I can't pronounce at this moment, but hopefully she joins us and we can do that. Erin has experience working in academic, public, K-12 school, special, and tribal library settings in Alaska, Montana, and British Columbia, Canada. And she has a, an MLIS with a First Nations concentration from the University of British Columbia and a Master ED from the University of Montana. And I hope that she can um, join us. She also currently serves on a public radio board of directors 
in the North Pole and the Arctic Women in Crisis Advisory Board and the Board of Directors for Friends of Tusi Libraries. She was um, formerly, she is a presi uh, president of the Alaska Library Association. Currently, she is the chair of Alaska Native Issues Roundtable. And so um, it's a very fascinating work that both of our speakers have done. Welcome, Laura. So I, my name is Laura London, and I'm titled my present my presentation, The Sixth Continent, because Antarctica was uh, the sixth continent that I've been to. So as Lloyda said, I just um, did a six month sabbatical. I returned back to the United States last month in March. Let's try this. And she already shared about me, so I won't spend much time on this slide, but I did start as um, a volunteer when my kids were in elementary school working in the library. And then I had various um, positions in libraries. Um, some of the more interesting ones, I worked in the Peace Corps twice and one time as a volunteer where I taught English on the tiny island nation of Palau, and I also served as the community librarian for my village. And then another time I went back as a Peace Corps response volunteer in Guyana, where I actually worked as a cataloger and a librarian for uh, the Iwakrama Rainforest in their research library. That was very interesting. Um, middle school was also very interesting, but for other reasons. Um, but currently I've been at the public library for the last 11 years. And probably about maybe 20 years ago, I got a goal that I wanted to step on every continent. So I've been working on that pretty much. And like I said, six continents. I have Africa still to go. So, of course, North America was easy. We live in North America. So um, my daughters and I ventured off a little bit on our own Anne of Green Gables adventure in Prince Edward Island in Canada. And there I dyed my hair red and wore two braids the entire time, which at the time my daughters found a little bit embarrassing, but now they look back at it and they think it was hilarious. <laughs> and everywhere we go, people would um, stop me and say, oh, you have red braids just like Anne. And I would say, I'm sorry, who? And they'd say, Anne, Anna Green Gables. And I'd say, oh, I'm sorry, I don't know Anne. And then they'd say, never mind. So this is my snarky sense of humor, I guess. And then um, in Europe, I didn't work in Europe, but I did get, I have been to five of the countries so far, hoping to get more. Luckily, I was there the day that the tower started to lean, so I was able to push it right back up. And then in Asia, I was lucky enough to get a job working in Japan for seven weeks where I was an American director for some um, English immersion language camps. And we brought English, like a summer camp experience to Japanese students all around Japan. I got to travel all around Japan with that group of students you see behind me. And they, um, we, we put on summer camps all around Japan that were very fun and dynamic and rather exhausting, but it was a great way to see the, the beautiful country of Japan and to make some lifelong friendships. And then I've been to five countries in South America. Um, most recently, I hiked the Inca Trail. I did that for my 60th birthday. And then um, the other picture shows where I worked in the rainforest, where I was the uh, research librarian in slash cataloger. And then I know I could probably find way better pictures of my time in Australia, but I don't know that I could find one that was more fun than this picture of me and a buddy in Australia with the Sydney Opera House behind us, um, or what I'm calling the best photobomb ever, where right at the moment we took a selfie, some poor guy got seasick right behind us. 
And then this is just a photo of my time in Oceana when I was a Peace Corps volunteer in that island nation of Palau. And I worked as the community librarian. So that was a unique experience where I got to wear a muumuu every day for two years. And then Antarctica. So um, the rest of my talk will be about my time in Antarctica. It took me eight years to get to Antarctica. Whoops, went a little bit too far. I applied over and over and over. I was just a squeaky wheel about it. And then um, finally last year, I was accepted into the program. So this picture and this slide just I pulled right off of the United States Antarctic Program's website. But it does mention that Antarctica is the coldest, windiest, harshest continent. And this always surprises people that it really doesn't snow much in Antarctica. It's really just too darn cold to snow much there. But when it does snow, it just doesn't go away. So that's why there's a buildup of snow and ice um, for millennia. And so it is the driest place on Earth. I thought Colorado, I live in Colorado, I thought it was dry. But um, now I feel like it, I'm back in the rainforest sometimes. The mean annual temperature in Antarctica is zero. I was there during the summer, um, which meant it was sunlight 24 hours a day. This is a picture that I took from a hill at McMurdo. McMurdo Station is where I lived for six months and it just overlooks the town of McMurdo. Uh, McMurdo is the largest station in Antarctica. Um, there are other stations represented by other countries. The United States has three stations, the South Pole, McMurdo, and Palmer Station. And McMurdo is by far the largest of all the stations represented by all the countries. The white expanse that you see in the photo photograph is um, the frozen sea ice. Now that ice did break up while I was there, um, broke up probably in mid-January, and became open water. And that was kind of a unique sight. I do have a picture of that a little bit later. That's when we saw the penguins and the seals. Well, we saw the seals all of the time, but that's when we really saw them, and we saw orcas and other pretty stuff like that. This is a picture of my dorm. I had one roommate in my room, and that was pretty lucky. Some of the people had two, and then there was another dorm where some people had up to four roommates. So everybody at McMurdo has a roommate. There's no getting around that. Um, the landscapes were just hard hard to describe how beautiful they were. It was um, otherworldly, really. I mean, I haven't been to another world, but it's what I would assume another world looked like. Um, these are giant pressure ridges, they're called. And it's where the sea ice meets the ice shelf and the ice and snow is thrust up into the air. And just to give you a scale of how large those pressure ridges are, the icicles that are hanging down in the forefront of the picture are taller than I am. So they're probably about six feet long. So they're just mammoth um, structures, building size structures. There's no vegetation in Antarctica, so there's no grass or trees or anything like that. So it's more pressure ridge beauty. We had the opportunity to take a tour and walk around by them with a guide because they're, it could be dangerous, so we weren't allowed to do it without a guide. And then people often ask me what we did for fun. <laughs> this was actually one very fun day. We often went hiking if it was tolerable weather. And um, this was one such day. And we hiked to that large rock behind me. It's called Castle Rock. And when we got to the rock, uh, some people handed us trash bags and said, here are your sleds. And I didn't know, but a trash bag makes a wonderful sled. In fact. I was going so fast that I was frightened for a moment, had to really dig in with my yak tracks to stop that bag. Uh, I, I was going very fast, but it was very fun. And who knew that a trash bag makes a wonderful sled? 
Um, the red structure behind me is a warming hut and it's nicknamed an apple. You can see why. But other things we did for fun, um, we watched movies or went to dances. There was a lot of live music and there was a lot of just um, hanging around in lounges, talking to friends, making crafts, things like that. Science lectures were offered one to once or twice a week, and I tried to go to every one of those that I could. Robert Falcon Scott was an early explorer of Antarctica. He was one of the South Pole um, explorers, and he had built this, had this hut assembled at McMurdo Station um, before it was called McMurdo Station in the early 1900s. And it still stands, and you can go in it with a guide. Um, and it's um, amazing. It still has artifacts that are exactly as they left it when they were rescued. He and his crew, or not he, but his crew. And um, there's some pants hanging up to dry. You're not allowed, of course, to touch anything, but you are allowed to take photographs. They even had a sack of old potatoes in there. And then this is a picture of that sea ice that I showed you earlier when it was all broken up. It was just, the colors were just beautiful. And we saw orcas playing in the bay right here. And one day we saw emperor penguins on an iceberg just like that one. Only it was a lot um, colder that day that we saw. And then and this is what you really wanted to know, right? You wanted to know about the library at McMurdo Station. So although I do work in a library and I have worked in a library for over 25 years, I did not work at a library while I was at McMurdo. I worked at um, in lodging. <laughs> and so I helped pass out room keys and unlock doors when people got locked out and did room inspections when people left the station. And um, but... There is a library at McMurdo Station. It's completely run by volunteers who attend a brief orientation. And the books are checked in and out through an Excel spreadsheet. It's actually way nicer than I expected. It's, it's a warm, inviting space. Personally, I think it needs a little thinning out, but uh, it's actually really pretty nice. Uh, all the books are books that People brought down there and left, donated, and has a warm couch area with a basket of kittens that people can hold while they're reading, and people do that because there are no pets down there and people miss their furry friends. Um, it has beautiful windows that overlook the sea ice or the water when it's water. <laughs> and um, It's a very comforting spot. This was one display that it's all about Antarctica. So it has a lot of old, old materials and some of the newer items. And then here we are, Earth Day, we're talking about ways to reduce, reuse, recycle. And that was something that we really took seriously um, in Antarctica. Every piece of waste has to be taken off the station. We're, we're not allowed to dump it or burn it or um, throw it away in the ocean or bury it or anything like that. So they take recycling and trash very seriously. And so all these um, three R's are very uh, stressed to everybody coming down there to work. First in reducing um, by Packing, you're asked to reduce any kind of extra packaging or extra items that you might not need. So even if you're bringing down a tube of toothpaste, for example, you don't need to bring the cardboard box that it comes in because that's just something that's going to need to be taken off the continent when you leave. And then for reusing, um, almost everything that you can imagine is reused. Um, if you have an empty jar, it goes to a craft room and it's made into a project or it goes into what we call skua, 
S-K-U-A. A skua is a type of bird that's common in Antarctica. It's a scavenger bird. So skua is an appropriate word for uh, the people on station um, going into the sort of free thrift store on station where you can skua unwanted items and scavenge them for your own use. So any anything that you don't want um, during your stay or at the end of your stay, you would donate to skua, even if it's a half-used bottle of shampoo and somebody else will be happy to grab it. So really nothing gets wasted. And then the items that are true trash or recycle are very much um, sorted. They go into trash centers like this that are all over the station. And they're very careful about sorting anything that's food waste, because although food doesn't really tend to mold in Antarctica because it's just too cold and too dry, it does by the time it gets on that warm, hot barge that ends up in California months and months later. So they really package, they really compress and package everything up really well. Um, and even recycling goes into one bin, but then we have full-time um, people working in the waste department in Antarctica that are further recycling it out, cardboard, corrugated cardboard, glass, et cetera. So gets put in these big bins. The smaller trash centers get put in these larger bins that are all around the station. And then people come in with tra uh, tractors or forklifts and empty them out and work on compacting them and sorting them correctly. And then well, the real reason why everyone is down there um, is because of science at the bottom of the world. So even if you're working in lodging, you're supporting science at the bottom of the world. So most of the people that are at McMurdo are science support staff. And so, you know, if you're a scientist working on, say, studying the ice core, that's what this is a photograph of, an ice core. Um, you still need people there that are electricians and janitors and kitchen staff and lodging staff, etc. So most of the people down there are actually supporting the science at the bottom of the world. So this is a photograph of an ice core that was bored out of the ice shelf. It's approximately um, 500,000 years old. And they can study it and learn, surprisingly, a lot from all those. I don't know if you can see it in the picture, but there's millions of little ice bubbles. And they can study the bubbles and learn about atmospheric conditions a half a million years ago in learn a lot about climate change or gases that were in the air. And they do that to try to see what patterns maybe have ha happened over the years and what maybe will be coming in our future. At the end of this ice core life, they broke it up and let us um, have pieces of it. So I actually got to taste it. And it tasted just like ice. We also have a lot of large satellites all around, and those are for receiving and transmitting communications. This is a NASA satellite. NASA has a lot of projects in Antarctica, including this large gondola. Um, I'm not sure if the picture shows it well, but there's a huge telescope at the top. And this went up into a balloon. That's the balloon it, when it was launched. And it went into orbit, it circumnavigated the South Pole three times before it came down. It was in orbit for 60 days, which was a NASA record. And that telescope was pointed at the stars and it was mapping the stars. So that was a very successful project that happened while I was there. It was called GUSTO, G-U-S-T-O. Um, in this project, this kind of reminded me of the global goals for sustainable development that Lloyd was talking about, the life below water. So in this project, some divers brought up some harmless sea creatures and they put them in this 29 degree water because that's what they like. <laughs> and it's called a touch tank. And we were able to um, pick them up and touch them. And uh, it's really fascinating. There were some creatures that were kind of recognizable, like the sea star I'm holding on the left picture. And then there were others that I 
had never seen before and couldn't even imagine were creatures living in the sea like some of the things on the left picture. And then other ways for energy um, conservation. These three wind turbines actually aren't part of McMurdo Station, but they're part of the Scott Base, which is the New Zealand station that's located just three miles from the U.S. station. Um, but because their proximity is so close together, we have a lot of partnerships with the New Zealand station. And so they built these turbines, and it, it just it's so windy in Antarctica that it produces way more energy than they possibly need at the Scott Bay Station. So they share. And um, we get about, we actually use way more of the energy generated from the wind than the, the Kiwis do because it, um, their station is so much smaller. So that's one way that um, we're preserving energy down there. Oh, and then this is what you really wanted to see, right? You wanted to see the science in the form of the animals. So I'm nearing the end of my presentation. I thought I, I would let you just take in the beauty of these beautiful animals that, that we have down there. And this is one of the two types of penguins that we saw. And this is an emperor penguin. We didn't see them as frequently as the Adelie penguins. The emperor penguins are the larger of the penguins. They're the largest of the penguins, I should say. They're three to four feet tall. They're very regal and beautiful. I saw them very rarely. And then these smaller Adelie penguins are more like toddlers. And they're very hyper and active and friendly and inquisitive. And they would run right up to you. And of course, we're not supposed to get near them. So we'd have to back away, but they would just keep coming sometimes. And we saw them very frequently once they arrived, once that sea ice broke up, we saw them very frequently. And um, they were a lot of fun to watch. And they're very small, like maybe up to my knees, maybe just two feet tall at the most. And then there were Weddell seals, and we saw them all the time. And there's a little guy waving goodbye, because that's the last slide of animals that I have for you. So if you saw any photos in my slideshow that you thought were really exceptionally good, those were taken probably by one of these people including this picture of the Polar Star icebreaker ship. The Coast Guard brought in this icebreaker ship two or three times, just kept cutting open that ice so that we could get resupply ships. And that actually helped break up the ice all the way. And then I did write about my adventure. Um, I'm going to warn you, it's kind of long. So if you're interested in reading about it, I sent it out um, while I was there kind of as an email slash blog. Um, but then I compiled it into one really long Word document. It's really, it's about 40 pages, so it's pretty long. But if you're interested in Antarctica, what it was like to get there, what it was like to apply, et cetera, um, the whole experience, it's mostly really positive. It does share some of my challenges and um, frustrations, but mostly it was very positive because, honestly, it was the best time of my life. So. Uh, if you're interested in reading about it, just shoot me an email at lllondon at ppld.org, and I'll send that to you. Or if you're interested in finding out more about the um, United States Antarctic Program, I really encourage you to go to that website, www.usap.gov. It'll give you way more factual information than I probably just did. It's a really nice website. It talks about the Antarctic Treaty and um, the, the countries that are involved. And it um, has really nice photos, too. So just thank you very much for that. And I believe that is it. Yay, that is it. Okay, Erin, you have the floor. <laughs> oh, fantastic. And um, thank, thank you to the technology team and Loida. Uh, thank you to the audience. Uh, folks that are sitting through our technology struggles, I genuinely appreciate it. And I will share you just got an authentic Alaskan Arctic experience. <laughs> um, I guess to start, I don't have slides, but um, 
speak in the mask. Oh, oh sorry. Um, and oh, um, I might have internet available. Um, <laughs> big gravy. So, um, my name is Erin Hollingsworth, and as Loida has shared, I am the school district librarian for the North Slope Borough School District in Utkiavik, Alaska. I am the sole librarian for the 11 schools in district. The district is the northernmost in the United States, um, along the coast of the Arctic Ocean. It's also the largest school district in the United States, um, geographically largest, not by student population. Geographically, the North Slope Borough School District is approximately 90,000 square miles. So um, if it were a state, that would make it the 11th largest. So the service area over which I'm a school librarian is bigger than 39 states. To kind of help provide some geographical context for the landmass we're talking about. Um, all of these communities are Inupiaq villages in the bush. And in the bush in Alaska reference, references the fact that they're only accessible year-round by plane. They do not have roads. They're not connected to the outside any other way than through plains year-round. The coastal villages are accessible by a boat. And some of the communities have ice roads in the winter. So I spend most of my time flying to schools in a little nine-seater Cessna caravan. Um, I'll try and share slides later, and because they're mostly pictures, right? And um, it's a tiny plane. They're very tiny, small, cold planes. Uh, the farthest villages to... So I live in Utkiavik, which is the hub. The farthest village to the east is Koktovik. Um, along the Canadian border, and I have to make several stops in a puddle jump to get there. So I go to Nuiqsut, Prudhoe, and then over to Koktovik, which is the polar bear capital of America. And at that site, um, this year when I visited in October, I saw two adults and two cubs. So, like they were just there in town. There's a permanent polar bear guard in town. Um, I've had library employees that when they're not working in the library are out on bear guard and kind of working to keep the community safe from bears that might wander into town. If you go the other direction, west towards Russia, um, the community of Point Hope, and that is about a two and a half hour flight in the, the small plane. And then the southernmost village on the North Slope is Anaktuvik Pass. It's located in the Brooks Range. And due to travel schedules, um, I have to take two jets and a bush plane and overnight in Fairbanks to get there. So to, to reach the students in that site, I have to travel for two days there and two days back. So it's a minimum five-day trip. Um, when I travel, I pack in my food. So I have a tote, a plastic tote that I travel and it usually has my food and my clothing. Um, my backup food for emergencies in case I get stranded. I usually travel with my sleeping bag and other bedding. And I go prepared to expect the unexpected. Um, as you're encountering now, technology is unreliable. Um, which makes library services really interesting. Education as a whole really interesting. We're currently supposed to be doing state-mandated testing. However, um, our fibers cut. They're working to install Starlink, Starlink the, to activate the system. It was installed this summer. Um, it was installed as a contingency plan when the fiber cable through Quintillion that all the other providers locally utilize. Uh, the ice sheared it on the ocean floor, and we were without telecommunications all summer. So it was about five months. And um, that was a really scary time because inter like being without internet and telephone is one thing, but dispatch, so emergency services dispatch, were all reliant 
upon that connection. So for the vast majority of the summer, 911 was not available. Um, so people weren't able to call the firefighters or the ambulance or the police. And I mean, that's a whole other side issue, right? But if we're going to talk about Earth Day and library and information access in the Arctic, especially if I'm, you know, phoning in because the fiber is cut, it, it would be negligent to not kind of go there. But um, talking to talking about services, there are approximately 2,200 students in the school district, so it's quite small. The smallest village has approximately 60 students in preschool through 12th grade, and the largest community here is the hub, and the elementary school that I'm connecting from, Freda Pollock Elementary School, is actually the largest student um, population in the state. With It usually hovers between five and 600. I have seen it up over 700, but our, our numbers are pretty low now. With that, usually prime, uh, library services are, um, you know, heavily rely on physical media because of access issues. However, the spaces are quite small, so it's kind of an interesting matter to navigate between having you know, items on the shelves, but also having a variety and keeping current, especially with limited budgets. Within my tenure at the school district, I've implemented uh, the use of digital school library, and we partner through the statewide collaboration with SORA. Um, which is the app provided by Overdrive, and manage to see like increased circulation, reading, checkout with audiobooks and ebooks when students have access. And that that's kind of the slippery slope, right? Is having these resources contingent upon internet connectivity, which excuse me is not reliable. <laughs> With regards to um, the question that kind of prompted all this, Floyd asking me about uh, when I moved to the Arctic, I moved here actually April 2011, and I had just completed my degree, my Master's of Library and Information Science in Vancouver at the University of British Columbia. So I went from what you know, is a large metropolitan area to the remote Alaskan bush, uh, it wasn't too big of a transition for me. Previously, I'd lived in rural Montana. So the remote and rural aspects of it, um, that, that wasn't a cultural shift. The, um, the, the light and the day, we're, we're tiptoeing now towards the 24 hours of daylight, and we will have about, I think it's 65 days. 65 days where the sun just does circles in the sky and it's a, I, it won't set, we won't see darkness. And that, that was kind of a difficult transition to move into 24 hours daylight. And then as the, the autumn comes and the sun starts to set, we move into the 65 days of nighttime. That too initially was kind of tricky. Now I'm at the point where I, don't notice it really. Um, I've managed to just kind of develop my routines or during the summer I just flip because it tends to be nicer in the evening anyway. It becomes tricky when you need to navigate in the nine to five world. Like if I have to go to the pharmacy or the grocery store or the post office, they're not open when everyone is awake in the evening when the weather is nicer. Um, that's kind of an interesting little little kind of mental shift that has to take place there. Thank you so much, Erin, for um, providing this snapshot into your life as a school librarian in the Arctic. Um, I appreciate so much that we were able to connect. And I have another question for you. And it's about, uh, and you talked a little bit about this, but if you could expand maybe, what are the differences between libraries contributing to preserve the planet in the Arctic 
and other places that you lived or worked before? Yeah, thank you. That one is really an interesting question because I, 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 I was reflecting on this when you shared this and I was thinking a lot about the carbon footprint, right? And what does having these institutions in the Arctic where everything has to be flown in, like what, what, what's the counterbalance to that, right? Like being really, really thoughtful with collection development, what can I provide digitally? Also, like, is there equity with that digital access given the, the number of connectivity failures we have? And also recognizing that digital items also carry, you know, a carbon footprint and kind of being mindful, being mindful consumers of information, right? Like knowing that the format and the media matters, also kind of being aware of many of the other things we do in libraries. Like I'll do crafts with the students and rather than bring in lots of um, expensive purchased craft kit type materials, I do a lot of found, upcycled, recycled, you know, we do a lot with like toilet paper tubes or cereal boxes or um, anything like that, right? Like utilizing materials on hand that are going to be just thrown away anyways and kind of making it something accessible and um, not necessarily flying more items here. But I mean, it, it, excuse me, it does get kind of tricky when you look at, you know, information and collection development and operating within a limited school budget and limited spaces, but then also kind of being mindful of also having access and making sure that just because these students in, in the schools are far removed geographically, but they're not removed with regards to, you know, what's the the cultural new thing, right? Like not having that that cultural isolation. And so kind of navigating how to provide information and resources and that contact, but also balancing it with is this all gonna wind up in the village landfill? Um, and it kind of navigating navigating those areas, I think is one of the bigger issues. Thank you so much. That's so important what you said about um, everything, but um, it did caught my attention in terms of um, cultural isolation um, because we are experiencing a phenomenon, right? Since uh, the internet, since we have the internet in our lives and um, it's, it's kind of an extension of our, uh, our hands and uh, but did you you did mention uh, many aspects that are linked to flying in um, supplies let's say or maybe sometimes when people don't recycle don't reuse that definitely affects our planet and our environment and um, but that at the same time is very important for the region you are living in and so it's everything is so linked in, but just, just focus on the cultural isolation piece. How then you and your colleagues um, work to support your students and help them to stay connected to our world at the same time that you are preserving or working towards preserving our planet? Yeah, it, it, it's really an interesting challenge, right? Working to navigate um, within bush flying in communities. Um, when we had a researcher come up and she was French and referenced the North Slip as a bit of an enclave. And I thought that was really kind of an interesting take to view it as a cultural isolate because we do have the digital connections. We do have those same, you know, the same level of media like streaming, streaming services and others, 
when the internet is working, right? So it's not necessarily reliable, but when we have it, we enjoy it. Um, this is something, um, one of the other topics that I like to embrace and address looking at bandwidth and access to the internet as something that should be federally regulated in terms of treating it like a utility, right? Um, because it does get tricky. We on the North Slope have a free and reduced lunch rate that varies from schools, but it hovers between 70 and 80%. And that is a factor because it contributes to our E-rate funding. So our federal subsidies to provide internet and telephone connections to the schools and the library are at about 80% because it's so high. Having to have a contingency plan like Starlink isn't covered in that initial bid, right? You you have to reward the government the government funds the contract to the lowest bidder. So being able to support a contingency plan is an additional financial toll. You're kind of looking at where funding and education in the state of Alaska is, looking at the fact that school libraries are not required in the state of Alaska. So it's kind of um, interesting to think that the 22, the 2,200 students in my care, while it's probably negligent that I only see them once or twice a year when I have the ability to fly to their village, they get significantly more library time than other students in similar situations in Alaska where libraries aren't required. Like they don't even have to physically have a library in the building. So <clears throat> kind of looking at, you know, navigating, having access to information, having access to someone to help teachers navigate national library standards because it's still an expectation for students to learn these standards and um, working to see that they're presented. I will share, despite being a very, very large geographic state, um, our professional community is incredibly small. Um, so that is kind of one of the benefits of being able to support and provide access. If it's something that maybe is outside my wheelhouse of expertise, I am able to go to our Alaska Library Listserv and ask one of my peers or colleagues if they can help, if they can kind of step in and help out. And it's the same with the educators in the state. Um, if you have any time here, I mean, it is, it is a very transient state for professionals in some regard. People come and go, but those of us that stay and kind of have that solid network when we need support, they're definitely individuals we can kind of reach out to and work to collaborate and kind of, you know, take things along with what we can piece together as we go. It kind of feels like an accurate assessment of how I'm presenting to you all today. I, I genuinely do appreciate individuals for their patience with this. And I, I do apologize, but it also is the reality of um, living in the Arctic and the problems with infrastructure that is inaccessible or aged and um, aging at a more rapid pace given climate change. Like the, it's, it's all of these issues of education and social security and justice and the environment, they all become interconnected in a very holistic lived way um, with my time up here. Erin, you have shared something I was um, alluding, mentioning earlier in my talk that everything is interconnected, is linked. And um, I am very sorry mm -hmm. about this uh, struggles, as you mentioned with, in this case, internet, but that can affect so many different areas of the life. And they are unfortunately um, an example of of you know, of in in a way of how we can, if the world right as a as a together as a whole, uh, join forces to preserve our planet, how we could perhaps 
help people from different parts of the world um, to have uh, a life where, in this case, uh, there is uh, some internet and connectivity, but it also, uh, it could be uh, the level of the seas, it could be um, different things. Um, pollution, in this case, uh, also um, for this year, the um, theme for Earth Day is planet versus plastic. And of course, what we do, for instance, in New York, where I reside, it affects other areas in the planet that are dealing with uh, huge islands of plastic that are um, invading the, the the coast and are also um, uh, killing uh, creatures in the seas or oceans. And so everything is is interconnected. And um, I'm just supporting right your your uh, what you said earlier. I have one more question for you and Laura. Um, I'm looking at the clock and I would like to open this for other questions. Maybe uh, Dr. Shao has questions as well. And what would you both recommend to librarians wishing to visit or work the, in the Arctic and the Antarctic? And of course, you can answer from your respective experiences. I will start with uh, Laura, and then I'll ask Erin to go on. So what do you recommend to librarians wishing to visit or work in the uh, in Antarctic for you, Laura? Okay, great. Um, so for uh, working, there are really no opportunities to work there as a librarian. They just don't have that position. I know, I tried. <laughs> um, but there are many positions open um, just to get the experience of working in Antarctica. Um, and I would recommend going to that usap.gov website. And that's there's a link there about jobs or careers in Antarctica. There's several different contractors who work to support the science. So, you know, if you're IT bent, there's one that specializes in IT work. Um, if you're more of a wanting to work in the kitchen, which is a great entry level to get there, much better chance of getting there. There's a company that hires those type of workers. And then there's one that does more of the trades type workers, like the electricians and carpenters and mechanics and things like that doctors, nurses, there's one for, you know, there's all different kind of companies that are contracted. So the earlier you apply, the better. Um, January 1st is usually when they post all the new jobs that would be leaving in October or September, October for the year. And they do hire as they, they fill them as they can. So they, it's not unusual for them to hire people in January to leave for the next September or October for the um, summer se season, which would be October to February ish, it might be a month before, a month after, give or take which position. Um, there's a lot involved. There's um, a lot involved as far as uh, me medical um, clearances and um, dental, eye doctor. Um, drug screening, background check, maybe a few more checks. <laughs> it's not an easy process. So they like to hire as early as they can. So you can get what they call PQ'd or physically qualified um, early. And then I recommend applying every year until, until you go. That's what I did. Actually took me eight years. Um, four years I was selected as an alternate but I just never deployed, which I think is very unusual. Usually when you're selected as an alternate, somebody drops out. But um, in my situation, I mean, good for the program. Nobody dropped out, but kind of bad for me that I was kind of on limbo. And it was great that my employee, my employer, excuse me, um, gave me a sabbatical that they let me just defer year after year. And one more question before we go to Erin. How the experience changed you in terms okay. of uh, perhaps preservation of the planet in that awareness or maybe actions too? Um, in terms of how that changed me that way, I think I was 
fairly good about, you know, um, recycling and not like letting the water run when I brush my teeth and stuff. But now I'm way more uh, diligent about that type of um, waste of water. Um, of course, there, you know, we really had to be careful of our water. The water was brought in from the sea and treated. And that's the water that we drank and showered with. And um, that's the only water we had. So, um, you know, we were encouraged to take short showers, to turn off the water when we lathered up and then turn it back on. And so, um, and I don't do that anymore, <laughs> but I do really am, am really cognizant of the water situation and also the trash. I think I've been really a lot more. I brought that home and I think I'm going to keep doing that. I don't think I was bad before. I'm better now. And these are themes that we can also bring into our work in libraries in terms of uh, saving not only water, but there are little practices that yeah. we maybe integrate. You think? I do. I do agree. Um, I already like had before I even knew what the, you know, plastic anti-plastic campaign I already was that way in my head so you know at our library here we have ceramic mugs for our patrons and then we just ask them to wash them out when they use them and um, we do still have some paper cups because sometimes patrons just do not want to use a mug that somebody else might have you know drank from and, and so we do try to make everybody happy but I would say the majority of our patrons do grab the reusable mug and seem happy to do so when we offer the program and so you know just encouraging little things like that if everyone did little things like that it would make a very big difference every little thing helps definitely thank you so much laura You're welcome thank you erin over to you what would you recommend to librarians wishing to visit or work in the arctic all right thank you um this might get me in trouble, but I could totally put in a shameless plug for Tuzzy Consortium Library because I believe their director, Tess, is currently looking for a public services librarian. And unlike the Antarctic with all the requirements, um, I mean, it's a job application, right? Um, I will share it, the, the living here is not necessarily ideal for everyone. Um, there is housing shortage, so um, uh, uh, finding reliable housing, securing housing is kind of tricky sometimes. Some providers, like the hospital and the school district, provide housing. I think the, the college does have some. So it's definitely going to, well, I shouldn't say definitely, but a high probability of a roommate situation. Um, but the, the school library, um, and that's, that's, I'm a one-person shop, and the public library is run through the tribal college. So Ulysavit College operates Pezzi Consortium Library, and they actually have um, the library director, an archivist, an academic librarian, and the public services librarian position is vacant. Um, and they provide public library hours in the outlying villages in the school library. So I collaborate and partner with them a great deal. But I would say anyone interested in Arctic librarianship, um, and it might be just kind of beneficial across the board, is that that cross training, right? Being being versed and adaptable and able to pivot. Um, when I was so prior to working for the school district, I did work at Tuzzy Consortium Library, and it was the director and myself. So, like, I picked up archives work. I did children's programming. I taught the one-credit library science introductory course for the college. I collaborated with visiting Arctic scientists. Um, I actually really loved it because it was a little bit of, you know, the different aspects of library service. And I, I didn't get settled into just one one particular item. Like having having a broad background really helped being able to go in 
and copy catalog or do original cataloging for, you know, locally created Inupiaq language resources uh, has been beneficial, but also, you know, being able to pivot and teach the class or do community services or um, having the tech skills to update the web page. And on occasion, I would go and collaborate closely with the museum. So kind of having those, those wide breadth of skills definitely beneficial in the Arctic or any, any um, of your more geographically isolated or remote type locations, right? Because odds are you're not going to have like a large staff and a team of people. It, it's going to be you. <laughs> and yes. right now that's kind of my library services. Like I have some support professionals that are amazing and um, just the skills of the educators that I work with, like it, it's above and beyond, right? But also a passion to be here. This is definitely a geography, a location that you need to choose. You need to choose to come to. And like, I don't know, I, I love it here. I think the 13 years on May 1st, right? So for me, I love the community. I love the people. I don't see the environment as maybe the obstacles some folks would. I mean, it would be a lie to say I enjoy when it gets to negative 60 Fahrenheit. I mean, that's cold and miserable. But also, there is a lot to counterbalance that. That just makes it a place that I'd love to work. And I think it's it's community and that ability to adapt and operate within all those roles and explore all of those kind of aspects of librarianship. I, I've really enjoyed that. That's beautiful, Erin. Could you um, maybe briefly share with us um, any practices that are related to this? You, you didn't mention some about recycling and reusing, but there are, are there other practices that you think that are very uh, specific or distinct to your libraries um, that perhaps might be helpful to other libraries in the world to replicate? Hmm. That it gets really interesting, right? Because some stuff, um, I don't know that I can be prescriptive, but I can definitely speak to, you know, some of what some of what works here and might work elsewhere. Like I, I heard Laura talking about water conservation, and that, that's huge in our community as well. Like not not all of our communities have homes with running water, so. Um, kind of accepting that sometimes folks come in and, you know, they just want to use the flush toilet and being okay with that. Um, but thinking to, you know, kind of that broader conservation and what libraries can do, I think looking to being mindful in, in consumption, right? Like paying attention to how we engage in capitalism and how we consume things um, and looking at that in conjunction with how we do select what what we platform, right? Like if we only have so much space, so many resources, we want to be mindful in our purchasing, like looking to authentic voices first, looking to what we want to what we want to prioritize, right? Like for me, I prioritize the purchase of Inuit published books. Inhabit Media is a publishing house out of Nunavut that is Inuit owned and operated. Their books are absolutely beautiful. So when I get to looking at, you know, my limited space and, you know, that mind to what am I flying in, what is going to last, what is going to be appreciated, um, what will appeal to my students, like those books are always going to be at the top of my order list. Like I look to see what's come out new and I know that those will be, those will be put in the library and loved, right? Whereas, 
you know, the other things that maybe just because it's new, do I need to add it? And can I provide it in a different format that, you know, is going to have less of an impact getting it to people? And that's kind of something I think we could probably apply across the board. But I'm I'm fearful because I don't want to say, you know, that I, I don't provide information, but it's more prioritizing and looking at what is going to be strength-based, be place-based, and utilized, and um, kind of moving moving in that direction with, with consumption in my library. Thank you so much, Erin and Laura. These are just amazing conversations, and I wish we could be here longer. Um, thank you very much. Uh, I, w I need to mention that Ray Poon gave me uh, the phone number of Erin's school. I text him when Laura was speaking because I was very concerned. I was wondering what what's going on with with Erin, and he immediately went into a librarian mode. He searched the internet. He texted me back. I called Erin's school, and after five transfers, someone got Erin somewhere. I called back, connected, merged my phone call through Zoom, and you were witnesses of all the maneuvering we had to go through. Um, and this is an example of, uh, really an example of um, what could happen, right, to anywhere in the world. Erin mentioned this specifically, how climate change uh, is is part of the situation where the perhaps the telecommunications are not reliable, right? And so um, it's the, it just highlights the importance of today, earth and preservation and the role that we all have. And the examples that Laura and Erin provided are just um, incredible because are coming from their own experiences. And I hope we are all inspired in a way of um, treat our planet better. And thank you so much. I see Dr. Chow is on the screen. I wonder if you have questions or final remarks. Thank you, Lloyd. Uh, first of all, I just want to say how impressed I am with uh, all three of you, but uh, in particular, in this case, Laura uh, and uh, Aaron, because of your willingness to step up and do what you're doing. So, and of course, like many things, you're getting an amazing experiences, I'm sure. So congratulations. Uh, yes, really quickly, uh, uh, two-part question. Um, and we can go over just a few minutes if it's okay, if, if you guys are okay with that, because I know we had some technical difficulties. But really, two-part question from our standpoint. So the first one uh, really is just as an individual, I'm busy, everybody's busy, and I'm not really thinking of Mother Earth very often. So can you guys... Um, Give us some suggestions on what can we do to help Mother Earth on a day to day basis, right? In other words, you guys are in it right now, but can you give us some suggestions on what we can do as individuals, like going to the grocery store, you know, obviously plastics? Any any thoughts on maybe what we sh we can do as just individuals in our respective lives? Well, um. I live in Colorado and about about a year ago, maybe two now, they implemented a rule and maybe this is everywhere, but I think I don't think so, where um, you have to be you have to bring your own bags everywhere. Grocery store, even. Even, you know, like a retail store. So at first, a lot of people grumbled, but now it's just um, just second nature to always have a a shopping bag or two. I, I carry three in my purse. They're the kind that, you know, fold up into themselves, mm -hmm. really small and lightweight. I just can't even imagine how many tons of plastic that is saved just in our state, much less, if, you know, other states are doing it as well. And money, because if you don't bring a bag, you can get a bag, but they'll charge you. I think it's a dime per bag. Um, just really makes a big difference. You know, we always have them in our car. And uh, that's just one small thing I think that'll help the planet. And I know that a lot of people, and myself included, although I always did have a bag in my purse, I didn't have three, right? And now I have three. Um, but <laughs> I, you know, making it a, a law or a rule, you know, um, we're librarians, we like to follow rules, right? Um, but that just made me always have them in my car, always have one 
you know, now three in my purse. So there's signs up at every, pretty much every store that says, did you remember your bags? (laughs) (laughs) I think that's, that's a great way to just a small thing to kind of help our, our mother earth. You know, what's great about that, Laura, is that the excuse that I always make is uh, I don't have time or I forgot. But you're right. I guess if if I'm going to really uh, practice what I preach, I need to actually make the time before I leave the house uh, to take all those uh, uh, reusable bags out of the closet, put it in the car so I have them. So uh, and then, Lloyd, I know you travel uh, worldwide. Do you see that? Um, that plastics yes. are not? OK, actually, I was in just in The Hague last week, just a few days ago. And um, I really liked that the grocery stores there sell bags that are fabric. And so you can wash them and put in your bag again. They have different sizes. And this time I brought a cup, two bags that I had brought, you know, earlier, uh, maybe last year. And um, I bought another one because it was a little larger. And so I have that and it just stays in my luggage. But I like that. Not is they're not only uh, reusable, but you can wash them, and you know, so it lasts even longer. Fantastic! And Lloyd, I think uh, before Aaron goes, I, I think Lloyd, let's let's uh, have a little bit of a, a social media uh, contest where everybody can take pictures with uh, themselves and their reusable bags. How about that, Lloyd? I think let's work with our social media team. Let's just have some fun with it. I think that would be a great way to celebrate Earth Day, right? That's really cool. Let's we let's do think it. about that. Yeah, yeah yes. a- absolutely. Sorry, Aaron, go ahead. Oh, no, it's totally good. I'm nodding along as someone who um, I, I walk everywhere with my, I have my backpack. Like I've got, you know, my normal book bag that I carry my laptop and daily stuff. But then I have a day and a half backpacking bag that I'll take to the grocery store. Um, and I understand accessibility, you know, what what people physically are capable of doing and what they have access to. But like for me, a big part is physically being connected. Like I, I spend all my time walking places um, or utilizing public transit because we do have um, a bus that runs around town, but um, walking, using, you know, my reusable bags, of, of course, right? I've got my, I'm on the radio boards. I've got my NPR bag and I've got my friends at the library bag and they just live nested in there. Um, but I also sometimes have the the plastic bag tucked in a pocket to pick up trash as I go. And I know that's not that's amazing. something that that's great. takes place everywhere. Mm-hmm. Right. Well, um, for me, part of that, like the connection, the connection to the earth is like quite literal. Right. I'll go and walk on the tundra and just kind of go get grounded and breathe it in and spend time there and become, you know, I'm invested in this ecosystem. And what can I do to kind of help lessen, lessen the load? You know, little things like if I make a sandwich, do I really need to put it in a baggie or, you know, is there another way I can get that to work? And, you know, there's small things like that, but then there's also like the larger collective and, you know, paying attention to organizing my travel because where I live, anywhere I go is going to be a plane ride. So kind of looking at planning things and being strategic with, you know, how can I get as much done on this trip as possible to limit the number of trips, but also kind of, you know, recognizing as an individual, my capacity is kind of limited. So then using my voice in other arenas to advocate for larger institutional and structure structural level change right because i i definitely am at kind of a point where i can see i can see the changes i mean 13 years in the arctic i've seen I, the literal changes right like the erosion that's taken place the different aspects like the plastic that loida was discussing earlier in the ocean um, live in a subsistence community where most of the food is locally harvested and looking at like what 
plastics in the ocean are doing to, you know, the food that's being harvested and, and how this is all cyclical and working to kind of break cycles and, you know, applying from a librarian perspective, like that education as well, like working to bring scientists into the library to better educate the community to talk about, you know, this is what's happening, but also this is your role and how you can kind of work to prevent and make things better. So kind of facilitating those educational and science outreach opportunities as well. And I kind of think that's an interesting place where librarians can kind of bridge, right? Like having, I know not everyone's going to have access to, you know, international Arctic researchers, but I, I'm willing to bet even folks in small communities, like local agricultural extension offices will come in and talk about, you know, things you can do to help with your local flora, fauna, you know, the soil, the wildlife, or, you know, aspects of what's within our control within our own community. Sorry, that was a little off topic, but we're kind of excited about the collaborations and partnerships. No, that's wonderful, Aaron. Thank you again so much. Uh, Lord, I do have a few final words, but go ahead if you have any final thoughts before. Yes, I want to thank uh, Laura and Erin big, big time because they have really showed us with um, perhaps with slides, but also with experiences over the phone as Erin, how what we do in different parts of the planet can affect these beautiful places that we think of can affect the entire planet. But in this case, we can really see how it can affect villages and people in the Arctic, in the Antarctic as well. And um, we do know, we hear about it, that we need to do our part to preserve the planet. But um, in many cases, some people are busy or uh, they forget things. But the people that live in these villages and in these areas cannot forget that. They they follow uh, these t- kind of non written rules because otherwise the survival perhaps um, of the village, of the land where they live is not very optimal, right? And um, Erin mentioned about uh, public transportation, walking, having plastic bags in her pocket to pick up uh, garbage uh, or you know trash that she sees along the way. If she doesn't do it, who's going to do it, right? So it's it's on them, and that's that's the thing that we perhaps don't think when we are maybe in New York where I live. Uh, but it's so important, and thank you. Uh, this is the this is the purpose of the day. It should be every day. Thank you so much for bringing this awareness to us today. Um, and I'm sure there will be, it will be uh, there will be a recording. And the school will share it and all social media. Thank you again. And thank you, everybody, that stay with us. Thank Go you, Lord. Thank you very much. Uh, so, uh, everyone, uh, let's give them a, a loud uh, uh, virtual applause for uh, Loida, Laura, and Aaron for all of their work. Thank you for sharing all of your wisdom and time with us. I do think that in many ways, that's the theme of today is that we all have to take individual responsibility, right? We have to take the time to do something. And when and as Aaron was describing picking up the trash, I remember at, at least several occasions where I've, I've taken tours of libraries and uh, campuses and the head, the the higher ups would be picking up trash while they were giving me a tour. And it goes back to what Lloyd has said, which is that they basically feel that is their individual responsibility to make sure and not make it somebody else's problem. So the iSchool is honored to sponsor this celebration of Earth Day. It's our third annual celebration. I again, thank Loida for being our fearless leader in this space. Uh, it is our goal to bring this type of global programming to our students and the field in general. What we find is that YouTube and the recordings are much more popular uh, as a supplement to all the wisdom that is shared uh, today. Also, I want to thank our entire team of Matsuko Friedland and Nicole Azoff, who helped organize and coordinate the logistics. Uh, Alfredo Alcantar and Caitlin Price, our fearless tech support. Uh, and Caitlin, that, that was you, you uh, particularly were impressive in helping us with Loida's uh, uh, amazing workaround. Uh, a full transcript and recording will be shared online, and I'll drop that link in the chat. Uh, but you can also search by 
Well, let's see here. So here's the link. Uh, also, please subscribe to our EDI channel, um, and this will also be posted there. I'll also drop that in the chat. And finally, uh, uh, our next four events will be as follows. So we'll have National Deaf History Month, Silence the Pride, and that'll be Tuesday, April 30th. So exactly a week from today, from noon to 12. And uh, I'll drop that link in the chat. We also have uh, Asian American, Native Hawaiian, and Pacific Islander Heritage Month, the role of libraries, museums, and archives in engaging with local communities. And that will be uh, on May 24th, Friday, May 24th, also from 10 to noon. Uh, Juneteenth Day, Standing Strong for Freedom will be June 19th from 10 to noon. Uh, and then finally, Pride Month, and we're still fi finalizing the logistics there. So again, I wanna thank everybody for your time. We're all in this together. Uh, I do believe Laura and uh, Aaron are going to be interviewed by uh, our social media blog as well. So uh, stay tuned for that. Uh, and again, thank you for joining us, Loida. Thank you for all that you do. And uh, we will talk uh, soon, I'm sure. So thank you very much. Thank you, everybody. Thank and you. Erin, we're going to hang up now. Bye-bye. Thank you, Aaron. Bye-bye. Be safe. Great. Thank you. Take care.